Hi, everybody. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, thanks so much for coming again. Uh, this has been very exciting to help organize this event. And that was fairly fitting because um, I'm going to be providing sort of the uh, informational reading slash cryptozoological component of the evening. And um, so I guess you guys probably know that McSweeney's is a publishing outfit. There's the quarterly journal, and there's books and magazines, and now movies you saw at the beginning there. And uh, so I wanted to tell you about one of the latest publishing efforts, which is an academic journal called Yeti Researcher. And uh, so Yeti Researcher is, like the title suggests, uh, devoted exclusively to scholarship about the Yeti. And, and Sasquatch? Yes, yeah, Sasquatch too. Also, you know, Bigfoot, Uma, the Kubu, the Ogagwe, basically the whole gamut of mystery primates worldwide. And um, I have a copy uh, here. Uh, to bring, this is the most recent issue, and we also we have a slide of the cover so you guys can check it out. Uh, so as you can see, the journal contains uh, some popular and some more technical articles. Uh, so the mission statement... The mission statement says that Yeti Researcher is meant to be a scholarly resource guide for the backyard beginner to the seasoned expedition leader alike. Uh, it is nonfiction, of course, as with all Yeti research. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I point that out because this is a peer-reviewed journal. We have a submissions committee, and uh, every so often we assign things. Most of the time we get submissions, and uh, we review them and pass them along. We even have fact-checkers, you know, because every so often somebody might, I don't know, misspell a famous Sherpa's name or... <laughs> kind of put the wrong date on a famous print, which, you know, it happens. I'm not going to deny that, but we can make those corrections uh, when necessary. Um, I don't know how many people here have this, but if you don't, I really recommend it. It's not just because I'm the editor, but also because if you're going to be on the field, we've got this really great and valuable resource that uh, hasn't been in print for decades, and that's the, uh, the brief bestiary of Chinese hill monsters there. And uh, people have been very excited. We got a good reader response, so we're excited about it. And uh, I'm not going to share it with you this evening uh, because it's in Chinese. And uh, also because I wanted to instead uh, sort of put together a special presentation which combines two of these articles. And that presentation is called Friend and Foe, Teddy Roosevelt and the Sasquatch. So the story starts in 1884. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt is age 25 at that time. He's already a legislator in New York City and a crusader against corruption. And of course, he's also a world-class hunter. We know from the many biographies how he transformed himself from a weak child into this robust outdoorsman. So that summer, 1884, Roosevelt headed out into the Dakotas for a month-long safari in the American West. Uh, during that trip, he brought down 170 animals, from buffalo to bunnies to bear. But he must have been looking for something more out in the woods. Strangely, the party's doctor was stocked with ether in very large doses. In addition to shop placement guides for bear and ungulates, ungulates are like deer and elk, horns and hooves, uh, Roosevelt also brought with him an uh, uh, anatomy guide for the recently discovered African gorilla. And he was unusually well armed for such a trip, carrying, according to his own diary, a number 10 choke bore, 300 cartridge shotgun, two 45-75 Winchester repeaters, the old trusty 4090 Sharps, and the incomparable 5150 Waverly Express. So Roosevelt had always extolled the huntsman's journey into what he called the borderland between savagery and civilization, where our ancestors led furtive lives among terrible beasts. So pointing to Roosevelt's mode of equipment and other evidence that we'll get to later, many Bigfoot scholars suggest that the future president may have sought the greatest beast of them all, or as Grover Krantz, the wayward anthropologist who became one of the world's foremost Bigfooters, later put it, when T.R. went into those woods, he was always double-barreled and loaded for Sasquatch. <laughs> you got a slide of him. <laughs> and his hunting regalia, very handsome. Uh, so fueling further speculation about Roosevelt and Bigfoot is his own telling of a face-to-face -face encounter. Uh, this appears in a collection of frontier tales that he wrote in 1893, which is called The Wilderness Hunter, and we have a slide of that as well. <laughs> That's a vintage edition. This uh, sold on eBay in the brisk market for Bigfoot material. 
80 bucks. <laughs> so, in The Wilderness Hunter, Roosevelt recounts a story of a mysterious frontiersman named Bauman, who was stalked in the Bitterroot Mountains by, quote, some great goblin beast. Bauman and a companion, the story goes, had bivouacked in an open glade. At midnight, and these are, this is Roosevelt's words here, Bauman was awakened by some terrible savage noise and sat up in his blankets. His nostrils were struck, it gets a little spooky, I'll just warn everybody. <laughs> his nostrils were struck by a strong wild beast odor, and he caught the loom of a great body in the darkness at the mouth of the lean-to. Grasping his rifle, he fired at the threatening shadow, but must have missed, as the thing, whatever it was, rushed off into the blackness of the night. And uh, we actually have some mood-setting audio that recreate the scene. <laughs> two guys recorded that stuff in the 70s. There's that, that's kind of aggressive Bigfoot, and then they've got vocalizations of Bigfoot in various modes of distress or excitement. It's, and then the whole thing is narrated by the guy who plays number one from Star Trek. And there's like a saxophone score, it's very weird, but highly recommended. Um, so later the beast kills Bauman's partner. Bauman returns from tending beaver traps and finds his friend with a broken neck. The creature, Roosevelt wrote, had not eaten the body, but apparently had romped and gambled round it in uncouth, ferocious glee. <laughs> serious. So, of course, in scholarly Bigfoot circles, this text is very important. Uh, it's one of the earliest Bigfoot records, presidential or otherwise. And um, uh, because it comes from this esteemed source, it forms sort of the keystone of the canon of Bigfoot documentation. Uh, and the importance of the story is actually particularly emphasized by one Michael Grimley, who is the author of an anthology called There Are Giants in the Earth, Survivors Since Genesis. We have that here. <laughs> Which is, it's fairly self-explanatory. <laughs> so Grimley takes a biblical approach, uh, not only to Sasquatch, but also to its historiography. He calls the Roosevelt story the last great chapter of the early Bigfoot narrative, the Deuteronomy, in fact, of the Bigfoot Old Testament, which is quite a distinction. Um, so going a step further, uh, Christopher Murphy, in his book, Meet the Sasquatch, draws a direct connection between, between Roosevelt's story and the infamous Ostman incident, which occurred years later, but in the very same area. That was when a young man named Albert Ostman was abducted in his sleep by an entire pod of Sasquatches, which, that's the technical term, by the way, if you're in the field and you need to know that, it's a pod. <laughs> and so this caused a uh, brief sensation in local newspapers. Osman eventually freed himself, he said, by enticing the lead male to eat an entire can of snuff. <laughs> and he uh, escaped in the ensuing confusion. <laughs> It's very clever, really. Uh, so Murphy also enters the realm of literary criticism by comparing the dread of Roosevelt's tale with similar tales about the Wendigo. And uh, the Wendigo, for those of you who don't know, was the common term for Bigfoot about a century ago. The name comes from Algonquin lore and means an ill omen. And so advancing his point, Murphy cites Ogden Nash's infamous 1923 stanza about the Wendigo that poetically articulates the creature's dread. And I will cite that briefly. The Wendigo, the Wendigo. Its eyes are ice and indigo. Its blood is rank and yellowish. Its voice is hoarse and bellowish. Its tentacles are slithery and scummy, slimy, leathery. Its lips are hungry, blubbery and smacky, sucky, rubbery. 
The Wendigo? The Wendigo. I saw it just a friend ago. <laughs> Last night it lurked in Canada, tonight on your veranda. Um, so there's clearly some poetic license taken there, since the Wendigo nor Sasquatch by any name has tentacles. <laughs> so uh, many Bigfoot scholars also point out that there's no external record of this Bauman character. But rather than impugn the credibility of Roosevelt's story, what they think is that, in fact, means that Roosevelt had recorded his own experience. And uh, so I was actually, I was in this email conversation with the moderator of the Crypto Forums, which is this clearinghouse of Bigfoot discussion online. And he sent me this email that said, if Bauman was not real, it's because Roosevelt created him as a proxy for his own eyes. So naturally wanting more insight on this possibility, I called Lauren Coleman who is a noted cryptozoological investigator and two-time winner of the Bigfooter of the Year Award. Uh, so Coleman is a retired professor up in Gorham, Maine, and he made his name in Sasquatchery as the author of A Field Guide to the Yeti, and Sasquatch, and many other creatures, including this guy that we have here, who, among the 200 drawings in this book, is the only one with no face, and uh, this other one that I'd like to show you. <laughs> <laughs> Which is just mysterious. I, mean, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> it is five feet tall, though. <laughs> and uh, just in case you're out there and you see like the other species of creature that has like a baboon dog head and for a fish body that's like two feet tall and then you can distinguish them right away. <laughs> and it's especially good if your vantage happens to also include the above and below the surface. <laughs> Sometimes. Uh, so Coleman now spends his time preparing Bigfoot lectures and providing guidance to, quote, serious expeditions only. Uh, but he affirmed to me several times this could be arranged very quickly because Gorham, Maine is serviced by what he called an international jet port. <laughs> Uh, so Coleman, nevertheless, was very ambivalent about the whole Bauman story. It was probably just a bear, he said. About the theory that Roosevelt was the one stalked by the creature, he said, oh, there's lots of theories out there. Some of these guys will believe anything. <laughs> um, but uh, many active Bigfoot hunters, they say that Coleman is just an academic, that he'll never see a Sasquatch up in his ivory tower. But if you understand real field work, it's very clear what Roosevelt was up to. And uh, so because Roosevelt was a hunter, that topic kind of always leads to uh, this other article that I'm going to bring in to this presentation, which is about the kill controversy. And uh, so for some of you who may be unfamiliar with the kill controversy, I'll, I'll fill you in. I mean, it's probably the most important issue facing the Bigfoot research realm today. <laughs> And uh, the dividing line is just from top to bottom, from the National Symposia down to your weekend Sasquatch societies that you all might have in your neighborhoods. <laughs> and uh, the question is so central because it defines everything. What's your, what is your tactical and, by extension, philosophical approach to that hopeful encounter with the creature itself? So the kill camp, of course, says, shoot the Bigfoot. <laughs> Their argument... It's very serious. <laughs> Their argument uh, goes that the world will only believe in the creature when there is a corpse. Grover Krantz, the wayward anthropologist we met at the beginning, was one of the earliest to propose the scientific value of killing a Bigfoot. We need a type specimen, he wrote in his 1986 masterwork, Big Footprints. <laughs> there is no other method for taxonomic verification. If you see a Bigfoot, kill it and cut off the biggest piece you can carry. <laughs> um, those are serious words. And um, Kranz also, he lived up in the Seattle area, and he was convinced that if he could just um, surveil the Pacific Northwest by the air, that he would maybe come across like a recently deceased Sasquatch, or maybe if he saw one, he could use his rifle to take him down. So, 
he uh, built himself a helicopter to do this, and we have a picture of Kranz in his <laughs> um, Sadly, this thing never left the ground. Um, which I realize now is because it seems to have no moving parts. Really. <laughs> Uh, so Krantz, sadly, did not find his Bigfoot corpse. Uh, but even without that evidence, he defied scientific practice by suggesting a genus name for the creature, uh, which raised a lot of eyebrows among his anthropology department colleagues. But the speculative designation he chose was Gigantopithecus, which reflects the theory, widely held, that Bigfoot is a relic population of the very real but long since extinct Gigantopithecus apes that roamed Asia prehistorically. And we have a slide of that. <laughs> and so this is a totally real creature known from the fossil record. Uh, it's uh, 10 feet tall, largest primate that ever lived. That's an actual size comparison. And uh, this specimen seems to be waving at somebody. <laughs> so the no-kill Bigfooters, who these days are the majority, they view Krantz's approach, his tactical approach, with horror. They say that Bigfoot is our sylvan ally, that he's gentle and deserves our protection. The Bigfoots they know usually shy away from campers and forest visitors, or at worst, alarm them by trying to make friends. One man I talked to said that when he was backpacking near Lancaster and came across a Bigfoot, he was at first scared, but when he decided not to run, Bigfoot came closer and gave him a crystal. <laughs> It was 1978. <laughs> uh, if you want to prove Bigfoot's existence, he added, look into your heart. Uh, there's also, I should mention, there's kind of a third, smaller, schismatic group that says that the kill controversy is totally moot because Bigfoot cannot be killed by mere humans because he's in fact a trans-dimensional shapeshifter. <laughs> so that's the paranormal controversy, that's a whole separate thing that we dare not speak of here. Uh, so in a roundabout way, the Kill Camp, however, they, said, they say that their interest is also to protect Bigfoot, because they want to bring one in to bring science on board and get endangered species status. For the sake of the species, they say, one must fall. Uh, in Kill Circles, this hypothetical sacrificial Bigfoot is known as the martyr. <laughs> and uh, so my take on that is that may be not such a bad idea. Uh, one of the species of elk that Roosevelt brought down on his original trip in the Dakotas in 1884 was later named after him. That's Cerebus Roosevelti, who we have a slide of here. <laughs> so, uh, Roosevelti officially entered the mammalogy text in 1897, giving North America's largest and grandest deer the name of the hunter who brought one back for the anatomists. So, there's a similar opportunity awaiting for Bigfoot because uh, Grover Kranz died before the taxonomic name for Bigfoot could be settled, and no one has yet even proposed the second specific name, which is the se that's like the part that identifies the species. Uh, so I suggested to Coleman when I was speaking with him, and I propose to you all here tonight, uh, that if they do find a specimen that satisfies the scientific community, maybe Bigfoot should be named after its most famous hunter, which would give you Gigantopithecus roosevelti, that would be fitting, Coleman said when I was talking with him. It would be a noble name for noble creature. Thanks so much, everyone.